Hi, I'm Jeff Jarvis from the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. Uh, we have a program in social journalism there where we start with the community. Well, in this crisis, we have to start with the experts. And so today I wanna to begin perhaps a short series of interviews with the experts I've been following on Twitter. I started a COVID Twitter list with 500 epidemiologists, virologists, infectious diseases, physicians, frontline physicians, and more. And leading the pack of those people in Twitter for me has been Dr. Greg Consalvis of Yale, who has been a trenchant critic of the coverage of COVID, especially in certain op-ed pages and columns. And I wanna talk about that with him. Uh, thank you for doing this, Dr. Gonzalez. Let me just start with the simple, basic question of what is your expertise and when and how and why should journalists be coming to you and your, and your colleagues? So I'm an epidemiologist, and if you take apart the word, there's epidemics in the front of it and ology, which, you know, is the study of. I mean, I, I'm not I'm butchering the sort of uh, origins of the word, but basically it's the study of epidemics and how diseases spread. And so my uh, background is really working on HIV, uh, and uh, associated infections for people who use drugs. But, you know, I work in a department where people cover everything from rotavirus, which is an enteric diarrheal disease, to respiratory viruses, to, to things like dengue and uh, chikungunya, which are tropical viruses, um, uh, which are widely uh, prevalent in the developing world. So my field of epidemiology covers the uh, breadth of diseases in the world, not just infectious diseases, but also chronic diseases like diabetes, cancer, heart disease. Um, our subspecialty of infectious disease epidemiology um, is sort of built for the current moment. We have an epidemic and we're trying to study it and understand it in real time. And so, you know, um, while my domain expertise uh, in terms of diseases is HIV, my training is in the broad sort of um, field of epidemiology. And, uh, I listen to other epidemiologists who do more work on coronaviruses or respiratory viruses or do disease prediction. And so I'm a generalist uh, in the war against COVID. Um, and there are much more specific people in my field with, with sort of more uh, finely tuned expertise um, who I listen to on a daily basis. If you're listening to me, I'm listening to them like Mark Lipsitz to Harvard and others. So um, let's start with the bad news which is to say that the New York Times op-ed page of late. And um, Dr. David Katz's op-ed, which you'll describe in a second, plus columns by Tom Friedman and um, Brett Stevens. Um, you've been very critical, angry about them, and, and I think in, in a very informed way. Take us through what was wrong with those pieces. So I think what was wrong with those pieces, and you know, to be fair to the New York Times, I think people uh, uh, in, in the editorial board uh, tried to uh, warn against the running of the article. I think I think um, you know there are other people doing fine work on the op-ed page to sort of inform people around the virus, like Nick Kristof, uh, who's paired with an epidemiologist and a disease modeler to sort of try to provide some real-time predictions with evidence uh, supporting what he's, he's doing. Nick Kristoff is sort of sitting in the background and saying, hi, I've been working with an epidemiologist and trying to tell you what's going on. Um, what Tom Friedman has done is taken David Katz, who is not an infectious disease epidemiologist. In fact, um, you know, his, his, his claim to fame is sort of as a diet doctor, and I'm not sort of denigrating sort of nutrition science, but it just um, that's what he focuses on in in most of his uh, sort of uh, career and, and sort of commercial activities. Um, he's also what, he's, what his premise was in the op-ed he wrote in the Times. Yeah, his so he basically went off uh, in the Times saying that um, maybe the um, concern about COVID nineteen coronaviruses was, was um, misplaced and that the real damage is uh, from the economic fall out from the social distancing that we're all doing right now. Um, and he said, you know, in, in my expertise, which is none, <laughs> um, he suggested we could put young people back into the workplace within a couple of weeks by sort of segregating uh, people who are at high risk for the disease, uh, which, you know, I think he conceives of as largely older people uh, and perhaps people would sort of um, obvious underlying conditions which might predispose them to severe disease um, and that you know therefore we'd be able to contain the epidemic 
damage and uh, stop the sort of hemorrhaging of, of sort of our economy over the next few months. Um, in fact, it was completely um, unsupported by the facts for a couple of reasons. One is um, we don't know who's all at serious risk of complications. Yes, of course, we know that people over 65, um, 75, 85 are at extreme risk of, of complications. But, you know, I was looking at the figures from New York City, 0.17% of people between 18 and 44 are at risk of serious disease. doesn't sound like very much, um, but if you uh, had 1,000 people, that would mean maybe 1.7 or so cases uh, of severe disease. Um, but if you start putting it into the, you know, there are over 120, there are close to 120 million people between 18 and 44 in the U.S. And then if you start multiplying 0.17%, uh, by that you have close to 200,000 people who could be at risk of severe disease. Um, so the whole idea that we could segregate people who are at high risk for complications is it, it, just not feasible. I mean, in terms of segregating the elderly, we're going to segregate and quarantine their caretakers. Um, now we've sort of flooded the community with lots of people who are susceptible to disease um, and they become carriers. So the force of infection around uh, our, our elderly and others uh, who are at high risk is now even greater than it was before we started. So any trip outside or any contact with the outside world becomes much more fraught and dangerous. Um, the other piece of this is that um, we don't want to see this infection across the country so it becomes sort of a seasonal reoccurrence. We want to sort of stamp it out um, as completely as we can over the next few months uh, to make sure that this isn't a, uh, a seasonal infection like the flu. Uh, and so we have a coronavirus season and a flu season, which kill you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of people every year. Um, and he was unwilling to um, take any of the criticisms that uh, we offered in a rebuttal in a letter to the New York Times letter section, the criticisms of other epidemiologists during infectious season, he doubled down. He went on Anderson Cooper. He went on Fareed Zakaria's GPS on CNN this weekend. Um, he's doubling down on it. And, um, you know, you know, you have to look back into his history a little bit. You know, he's been a proponent of different kinds of evidence when we talk about science, um, largely because he, he's very interested in integrative medicine and alternative medicine. Um, and so, you know, dealing with sort of basic uh, uh, clinical evidence and clinical trials and epidemiology are not satisfactory for his view of the world uh, in his daily life. And now he's gotten to interest in COVID and coronavirus. And again, evidence is really not a matter uh, of his prime, his prime interest. It's a little bit of self-promotion. Um, you know, he has websites that sell nutritional supplements and, and, and give diet advice. Um, and I think this is a PR campaign for him, which, you know, the editors of the New York Times should you know, scratched a little bit beneath the surface to, to see who they were dealing with, um, rather than giving him airtime, which has shaped the national debate in, in untoward ways. So when, when I saw your, um, when I read the piece myself, I thought this is too contrarian to be true, uh, too easily contrarian. And then I too did some quick Googling on him and found him to be a member of the uh, advisory board for the California Walnut Board, not where I would expect to find expertise in a pandemic which is one of your first complaints is to the New York Times, you take that space and that platform and they chose to hand it to someone who was not expert in the field, who was not an epidemiologist. Uh, what were the qualifications that one should have to be able to, to write about that? And then, and then the next problem, of course, is that, that that premise that the treatment is worse than the disease soon went into the head and out of the mouth of the President of the United States and became policy. Well. Look, I mean, you're a journalism professor. You know, it, I, I've been around for a long time working on HIV and other epidemic diseases. And there are amazing health reporters out there, amazing health editors out there who have won Pulitzer Prizes for their work. And they tend to sort of go with the science. So they, they triangulate and decide, um, okay, here's a claim. Let's verify it by talking to other researchers in the field. Let's go to the original articles and look what they say. Um, and so, you know, if I was Jim Dow or um, James Bennett and thinking of somebody I needed to speak to sort of the trade-offs uh, in the control of coronavirus, you know, you, there are plenty of people who um, could have been approached. Mark Liptich, who I mentioned, who's at Harvard, you know, I think tried to get uh, space on the op-ed page in the Times and, the, and they sort of, they sort of pushed him aside. You know, he's the leading expert, I would say, sort of from my field. 
uh, on the disease right now in this country and has had quite a public voice in other places like Stat News and other places that are sort of more attuned to sort of the evidence base and public health reporting. You said that they went, you found it a, as a contrarian piece. And I think they went for the clickbait and the, the wishful thinking and easy answers, um, which, you know, no journalistic outlet, no newspaper, no, no television station should should do that. But we know the, the world we live in now where, um, where, where cash is king and clickbait is, is, is not far behind. It's also part of our uh, false balance uh, doctrine that, that oh, if there's one side, there must be another one. And if we present both, then somehow we're doing our job, which is not true in science as a rule. Yes, there is debate and yes, there's a process. The other problem we have is that we tend to treat the latest word as the last word. Right. Wine will kill you, wine will save you. And we do the story as if that's, that's all there is. Um, one more moment on, on, on this little string of the time. So then that piece is up. It quotes, uh, uh, I forget the first name, uh, Stephen uh, Ioannidis, I think his name is. John Ioannidis from Stanford. Thank you. Uh, who had written a piece that in the medical world, not the broad world, was also a little contrarian, but got a lot of reaction from experts and a lot of debate. Nonetheless, Katz quoted him, then Friedman in turn quoted both of them, and Brett Stevens in turn quoted them, and there was a little echo chamber within them about how this meme continued. When Katz was on um, the weekend TV, did he get challenged at all? Uh, how was he interviewed? Was it just tell us what you think and that was that? Well, I, have, I, haven't, I, have, I haven't seen the, the footage, but apparently Don McNeil from, Donald McNeil from the New York Times, um, Took him, took him apart, um, okay. and sort of challenged him. But this is the thing, you know. It's I can complain, and I have complained to health reporters about their reporting on, you know, specific nuances of a story or the way they approached it. But people like Donald McNeil, um, you know, are responsible science reporters, and there's many of them across the country. And um, this is what happens when you have inexpert editors um, approach a story uh, or the their approval of an op-ed piece without having any sort of background in, in, in what they're doing. Um, and, and, and being sort of um, arrogant enough to think they know, know better. You know, the, the interesting thing is that the piece from my colleague at Stanford, who I don't know well, but um, we hired one of his PhD students, is that he works on meta-research. His job is to criticize research and to say, you know, uh, your reliance on p-values or other sorts of uh, sort of traditional notions of, of uh, scientific uh, rigor are misplaced. And he, his article in Stat News was basically to say, we don't have enough data to, to make claims on this and treating it as a research critique. Uh, and Mark Lipsitz, again from Harvard, said, we have enough information to, to make a decision to move forward on, um, on COVID-19. Um, because in the real world, we operate with partial information all the time. My colleague from Stanford is really thinking about if this was a research project. This isn't a research project, the public health project. You know, I wanted to say one thing. The Brett Stevens article, the most recent one, his mother <laughs> said, I didn't know you went to school for epidemiology or public health. But Stevens' mother, you know, gets the last word. And she basically uh, uh, told her son to sort of pipe down and, 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 and uh, stay in his own lane. Let's hope he listens. Right, let, me, let me go to a broader question, which is covering modeling. Uh, I've, I've seen some good pieces. Uh, Kai Kupferstadt is, uh, Schmidt is a, is a good, I think, uh, German uh, health journalist. Um, and, and there are a few others. And there's the, the, suddenly, as you've said, we have armchair epidemiologists. We had a, a, a famous piece in Medium that Medium took down of a data guy saying, I thought data is all the same, I can understand it. Um, we have the difficulty we've seen in the UK of the Imperial College models versus the Oxford models uh, affecting policy and affecting coverage and journalists not understanding how to cover the uh, the science behind and the and the interpretation of models, uh, and then we see the politicization of them. But but it, uh, talk to us a little bit about how journalists should approach these models when they see them. So look, models are always a sort of um, imperfect uh, creation of the world. I mean, George Box, who's a famous statistician, said. You know, all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, and, you know, I, I think of it, again, it's a sort of exercise in triangulation. Um, you know, uh, you know I, I'm not gonna put all my um, thinking into the, you know, into the 
the Imperial model or the Washington State model or the model out of Harvard, you want to see what they all say and if they're all sort of pointing towards a, a similar consensus. And if there's an outlier, you want to sort of start to ask questions about why that's the case. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, the, some of these models are coming from completely different sort of methodological um, perspectives and approaches. Um, but again, it's, it's, it means that if you're a journalist and you're picking up uh, Neil Ferguson's paper or Chris Murray's paper from University of Washington, you have to sort of start to sort of dig deeper and, and see it as one piece of information in the story you're writing. Um, and, you know, talk to them about their assumptions, how they came up with these estimates, what they think are the limitations of what they did. Um, because I think a lot of models will say, guess what? We're at the beginning of an epidemic with very little data collection. We're, we're sort of basing models on what happened in China, which may not be or may be applicable to sort of uh, countries outside of it. And so we're using a lot of data to build these models that are not necessarily local. Um, and uh, we're doing what we can with partial information. I do think um, the interesting thing about what's happening now with modeling is it's all sort of, I don't, I don't think any modeler, uh, I think the community of modelers right now is, is pretty aware of the, the threat of the disease and is not going to sort of downplay it in the way that um, Potentially, the Oxford model did a little bit, but I think, um, you know, it, it was a sort of an outlier. And, you know, I haven't looked into the Oxford one very much, um, but when you start to sort of collect information in total, you start to see a picture that emerges, which is pretty clear, is that we're in for a serious epidemic uh, in the United States um, based on the projections we've seen from all of them. The headlines on the Oxford model said that uh, half of the British population had already been exposed. Uh, to the virus or had the virus. Um, the main fault there, I think, was in the headline writing. Uh, but, but explain the kind of extremes of models, how models can play out in that way that, that give that headline writer that, that extreme moment to mention. Um, so it depends on your assumptions. Uh, you know, you have to look about what goes into the models and what comes out of the model. It's interesting that, you know, Adam Kucharski, who's a, a modeler at the London School of hygiene and tropical medicine um, uh, questioned the Oxford model saying, you know, we actually don't know that half the population of the UK has been infected with, with, with COVID-19. Um, you know, I think he's willing to admit that there are more cases than reported, um, but, um, you know, As there are multiple sort of scenarios that could explain the the deaths reported in the UK and the and and uh, the numbers of people that have been infected so far. And so I think there's some controversy over it. And what you saw was what happens in science is that um, uh, there was an outlier study from the Oxford Group, and and their peers went and said, okay, let's pull it apart. Um, let's sort of do peer review in real time. And others are saying, well, let's look at this. Let's look at that. Um, you know. That's how science works sort of in the, in the real world, although it's done behind closed doors, but you're seeing in the pages of The Guardian and other places where modelers are saying, okay, wait, 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 Let, let's look at the Ferguson model, let's look at the Oxford model, let's look at the Harvard model. And so there's a lot of sort of um, external vetting of these models in real time, which helps to sort of sort the, the wheat from the chaff. There's also the, that's in the, in the journalistic world, there's also the politicization of the models. Uh, Ferguson at Imperial gets either uh, quoted and praised or attacked in politics in the UK. Similar things have been happening to modelers here in the US. Um, how should journalists be telling, be judging uh, political and policy use of models? So one is if people are cherry picking, um, if, you know, if there's a house model, you know, trotted out by any politician to say um, the answer is X rather than Y, is again to triangulate and say, okay, what do the other models say? Um, is to talk to modelers who haven't uh, been involved in, in any of the existing models and say, what do you think of each of them uh, in terms of their strengths and weaknesses? And so it's not to take everything at face value. Um, you know, as you, you said earlier in this conversation, um, you know, the, the latest news is often what counts. And so the, the Oxford study comes out, it's new in everybody's mind and people start sort of taking it at face value instead of saying, okay, let's put, put the Oxford model down on a table with other ones and start to think about um, how it was built, how it compares with the other ones, what other people in the field think of it in terms of sort of uh, 
peer review of its of its uh, crafting and, and its assumption. And so it's it's not a hard thing to do. It's we, we review things all the time in our lives, and if this is just a piece of peer review that you know journalists can find scientists to help them do that. Um, it's interesting. Science reporters generally have a, a, a large social network or professional network of, of people they go to when a new science story breaks, like outside of the context of the epidemic, a new discovery, they don't just sort of print it in the pages of, of, the, of the newspaper or on TV. They generally sort of do some fact checking and, and try to understand what the implications are of this new discovery is. And that's a science, science, science journalism is generally um, uh, much more adept at dealing with sort of uh, things like this and sort of generalists, uh, which, which have been called on to write about the, the pandemic in, in many places that don't have science uh, or health reporters anymore. Indeed, some newspapers are literally moving people out of the sports and entertainment department into covering COVID and they need help. Um, you mentioned the network. I'm, I'm curious about this. That, uh, I, so I came in and I created a Twitter list of 500 people. I found it to be invaluable because I'm looking at the experts. Um, this is your life where you live every day. How useful is social media for you as an expert in this crisis? So it's strange because um, there's tons of epidemiologists on Twitter, for instance. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's all these backdoor channels of discussion through Slack and email, um, but um, some really wonderful scientists are, are on social media who um, are seeing it as a public service to either use social media or write directly for you know a, a, a publication with general interest, um, and I think it's act, you know I think it's fantastic. I think you know the fire hose approach to social media is that it's hard to decide what's real and what's not real, um, but again you can start to sort of um, build a pile of trusted uh, uh, scientists who you can rely on as a reporter or or an editor um, and um, you know, you can direct message them on social media often to get uh, questions answered much more quickly than you'll get them to check their sort of, you know, millions of emails that are coming in every day. So it's been a very good way of communicating information. Um, it's also been a tool for misinformation. We know that. Um, but on the whole, you know, I found out lots of little bits and pieces of stuff that's going on across sort of the breadth of the response to COVID that I would not know of, not just sort of epidemiology, but clinical stuff. Um, I, you know, I've seen stories by journalists that, you know, I somebody sent me a, uh, an editorial from a West Virginia paper, a very tiny one, about uh, social distancing and um, the science behind it, and it was brilliant. Um, you know, I think of West Virginia as sort of a red state, uh, and it challenged the president directly, uh, and um, he was incredibly brave, and I, I wrote to the guy and said how wonderful I thought it was. Um, you know, it, so to, if it wasn't for sort of social media, you wouldn't know these things were happening. Can you send me that? Uh, I'd, I'd be grateful yeah. if you can find it. Um, so what stories are we missing in journalism? Um, what are we not covering or covering right uh, at this stage? What, what, we, what do you th wish that journalists would be asking about? So it's starting to happen, sort of, um, the, the absolute collapse in the response to COVID-19 starting in December. Um, not enough tests, not enough ventilators, not enough masks. I mean, how does that happen? <laughs> You know, I, there's like, an, like a total systems failure um, in, in the federal government, um, which snared career scientists and, and public health workers who ordinarily respond superbly in these, these instances. So I feel like it's a management failure. You know, getting that information is, is actually going to be the work of investigative journalists. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to FOIA our way out of it. Um, we're going to have to get sources and go deep into these agencies to figure out what happened. Um, because, you know, as Andy Slavitt, who used to be Obama's um, direct administrator for Center for Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid Services, said this is the biggest public health failure in a century. Um, you know, so, so it's the story of a century, how the failure sort of um, escalated and, and ran out of control. So now we have the largest epidemic of, of, of COVID-19 in the world. Um, so that's one piece. The other piece, you know, Math Matthew Herper from Stat News, um, published a piece this morning on sort of the fact that we are still not out of the testing debacle and that um, if we're going to stop social distancing and get to leave our homes anytime soon, the core 
basis of that is going to be the, the availability of the test or the production of both the PCR tests that tell if you have an active infection and one an antibody test that tells if you were exposed and recovered. Um, the manufacturing and the of them is one piece that, that Matthew talked about, but also the deployment. How are we gonna test everybody who needs to be tested in our communities to understand when we can get the all clear? And um, the president was on the front of the New York Times today saying, I haven't heard about testing in weeks. We're doing great with testing. And so um, the sort of failure that started in December is still not ended. And I would love to see somebody pull apart uh, to take Matthew's story and explode it into all the sort of component pieces into a long form piece of journalism that talked about, you know, why, you know, three to four months in, we still can't get our act together. Um, you know, it, you know, it's easy for me to say it's the president and, but like, what are the details? Who's, who are the people who've made these decisions? You know, what were their motivations? Is there any sort of path forward that sort of can give us all a little bit of hope? Um, you know, I mean, I think also um, looking at the, I, mean, I spoke to a reporter in Arizona yesterday um, about Governor Ducey's decision not to, to, to do a stay-at-home order, uh, but also to put things like hair salons and golf courses on the essential services list. And I think the public health happens at the state and local level. Like the, the future of this response is really, you know, Trump can say what he wants on the lectern every evening, but the governors and mayors around the country are gonna be really in charge of when social distancing starts and stops. And so local journalism becomes incredibly important. You know, this reporter who is sort of dogging to Governor Ducey uh, uh, in Arizona, I talked to somebody who's working for the Milwaukee um, Sentinel, Sentinel you know, yes. um, about, the decisions about prisons in, in, in Wisconsin and, mm -hmm. and, and the calls to sort of release elderly prisoners from, from incarceration. There's, it's interesting, there's lots of local state reporters starting to dig into the, the decisions, good and bad, that are happening in their own states. Um, I, I think the rubber hits, you know, it's pretty easy to, to talk about the sort of national stage and focus on the, the national reporting, but the local and state reporting is going to be crucial in this regard. And as I said, West Virginia, Arizona, Wisconsin, there's some people starting to do some you know, important investigative work or editorial uh, writing uh, in places that are far from New York or DC or Los Angeles or San Francisco, where a lot of the sort of action is right now. That's very interesting uh, and, 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 and kind of new to me because I was thinking about this as a national story. I think you're right. When, when, when rubber hits the road, it's going to be locally. It's going to be the policy decisions made locally. Um, the problem is that local, the general view in my world is that local journalism is poor uh, because of the business uh, of chains going bankrupt, uh, huge firings, a uh, long time since they've had science reporters on local <laughs> newspapers. I mean, it's interesting. I have a, uh, a colleague, Ken Ward, who um, is a journalist um, from West Virginia. Um, who won a MacArthur uh, Fellowship with me the same year. And, you know, he's started a new nonprofit journalism um, uh, organization in West Virginia, I think with the former editor of the main Charleston newspaper. Exactly. One of my students is, uh, is interning for them uh, in, as an engagement journalist uh, this summer. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and I think a lot of, you know, I think there are, there are foundations and other groups that are starting to support non a nonprofit model of local journalism. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that is where where we may be finding our sort of hope at the local and state level. Um, to be said, you know, the reporter from Milwaukee was USA Today. I think the other one from Arizona is also a stringer for USA Today. Um, and so there are people trying to do good work at these papers. But yeah, there's been consolidation. There's been um, sort of um, firings, and and you know, the state of state and local news is not great. But you know, I think we do have to call out the good work that's being done even in this time of sort of journalistic distress at these areas, but so. So um, in the coming weeks, what should we most be looking for? Uh, my presumption has been that we, if we, if we have to get our act together on testing. We then have to have tracing associated with it and, and isolation to know where we go. Is, at the same time, we have the emergencies of PPE and medical equipment. Um, how do we prioritize that? How do we, how do we look at uh, the indicators of moving toward progress or getting worse? So Scott Gottlieb, who is 
uh, President Trump's former FDA commissioner um, co-authored a piece by the American Enterprise Institute yesterday, which was a roadmap to sort of um, the end of the coronavirus pandemic and talked about four stages. The first stage is the one we're in where social distancing is, is key um, uh, and sort of dealing with the immediate crisis is important. Phase two will be when we can scale up testing, both antibody and viral testing, and when we have sort of reduce the backlog of cases in the hospital. So we see a two week sustained decrease in, in cases. Um, and we have, uh, you know, ICU beds are clearing um, and we can get out and we can test everybody and can start to move people gradually back into the community. Um, um, but this is again, gonna take a massive scale up of testing as we just discussed, you know, uh, sort of watch, watching and waiting and see how good our social distancing is to see that cases over two weeks are, are significantly declining and sustained over two weeks, giving you a sense of, that the epidemic is starting to ebb in local, in, in, in local places. And this might have to be a regional decision. It might have to be uh, the Northeast, the Southeast, the Midwest making decisions together because, you know, one outlier state that decides that, you know, Florida or Mississippi or Arizona, that this isn't important could, could, uh, spark a resurgence in the epidemic for others. Um, but, you know, the story is going to be, is going to follow this sort of roadmap that the AEI put together, because it's going to be when we start to see decreases in cases and we see, and we have the tools we need to sort of go out now and think about who's still remaining infected, try to isolate them, um, figure out who's exposed. So if they have antibodies, but they haven't been sick and they still, they have no circulating virus, maybe they can go back into the workforce. Um, it's going to be a gradual um, return to normalcy, but based on a sort of massive public health scale up and seeing, and it's, again, it's going to, you know, it's not going to happen um, evenly across the country in terms of sort of the epidemiological trajectory of cases, but also um, the, the, the ability of state and local public health departments and healthcare providers to sort of um, tackle the task ahead. It's going to probably need a national, uh, you know, we talked about this $2 trillion dollar uh, package that passed the Senate and the House and the President signed, but um, we're going to need to think of a sort of Marshall plan to get us uh, into phase two uh, that Scott Gottlieb and his colleagues talk about. It's not just going to happen with the sort of status quo of efforts and sort of dogging that on a national level, but also the state and local level is going to be really important. It's going to need, you know, it needs the sunlight of journalism. You know, I, you know, you saw me go a little bit crazy on Twitter this morning against CNN because they like the, they're, just sort of not reporting the facts on the ground. They're sort of treating this as sort of, you know, infotainment. Um, but we're going to need the, these these reporters on in the national sphere and also the state and local sphere to be able to sort of tell us what's going on and provide some critical analysis. Not you know, epidemic bad or good. I mean, not the both sides isms that we see or the sort of um, uh, clickbait you know editorial decisions like we saw by Jim Dow and Jim Bennett. Um, so I think there's you know, I think journalists are going to be key in the, in the next phase. I think they've been key, but I think, you know, we, we get our information in lots of different ways now at time, nowadays. But, you know, when I click on something, more often than not, it's coming from a, a, a journalistic outlet, whether it's a print or online journalism. Um, I'm, I'm not getting, you know, I see epidemiologists and other sort of experts online, but a lot of it gets sort of synthesized and put out by journalists. And I'm trying to figure out who to trust and who to read. Uh, and uh, we need more people to be sort of doing this work in a rigorous way. Well, I also think we need experts getting more airtime. Part of your complaint about the New York Times was they, they chose to give a space to somebody who was not expert. Um, yeah. I think cable TV is doing a fairly good job of getting some good people on the air. But there are, in my Twitter feed, good Lord, I see 50 people who are great explainers, uh, who bring expertise to this, who ought to be on the air more. Are you, I mean, not to put you in a position of ego, but are you on the air enough? I don't need to be on the air. I just want to see good people on the air. Okay. Right. You know, if somebody asks me to do something, I will do it. Like I'll, I'm probably going to talk to somebody from an Arizona Fox station later today because I care about what's happening there. Um, you know, people who are writing stories about incarceration and, and COVID-19, I tend to sort of talk to them a lot. Um, the problem for some of the cable TV outlets is that they need, they feel a desperate urge to sort of, um, you know, let's talk about the ban and our, let's talk about the states that are not doing social distancing. They'll always feel the need to say, and now let's bring another perspective about how maybe Florida and Arizona and Mississippi don't have to, it's like, actually, no, 
right. you know, evolution true, evolution false, earth flat, earth round. I mean, this is the, this is the level, this is the level. I, I, I mean, I think, you know, to be fair to producers, they wouldn't necessarily put a flat earther on, on, on a CNN evening panel, but I think they have so little conception of how uh, large aspects of science work, including epidemiology, that they can't sort of say like, Actually, there is no rat. You know, David Katz is a is a pseudoscientist and a quack. Um, they can't sort of judge the wheat from the chaff because um, one is because they don't try, um, and two is because um, they just don't have that sort of history as a science reporter or a health reporter. And and I think you saw the same thing I did when I when I would retweet you about Katz. People would come back and say, "Well, but but uh, freedom of expression." Uh, no, uh, freedom of expression includes good editing includes deciding what to put on and what not to put on. Yeah, I'm total, I'm a little bit of a First Amendment absolutist. So like, you don't have to explain to me that, you know, we need freedom of the press. Um, but um, in all times and including times like this, you need sort of responsible editing that doesn't sort of misinform or disinform because then then what are you really doing? Um, you know, it, it becomes, I, I don't know, I don't understand the sort of desire to sort of print all sides of the story, even if they're, they're false. Um, because it's really, it's not a, look, it's not a public service uh, in, in any shape, way, or form, even if um, people like Dean Beckhead at the Times think like people can make their own decisions about um, whether President Trump lies or not. Well, actually, perhaps at some point, the, the editor-in-chief of major newspapers have to decide um, if somebody's lying about a pandemic that's sweeping your country, whether you call it out or not, or, or that seems too partisan. Uh, or uh, uh, unobjective for you. Well, I responded to your tweet this morning about the C Brian Stelter retweeting a, um, a CNN story normalizing Trump. Part of the problem in our business is, and Jay Rosen at New York University writes about this often, we don't understand how to deal with anomalies, which is odd because you think that news is the anomalous act, and so that's what we cover. But we put things in templates. Uh, there's the trend story and there's the presidential story and we expect presidents to act presidential and keep trying to put them in that box. And we have no systems for dealing with this extremely anomalous moment. So then, now I get to ask you a question. It's like, it's been three years and Jay Rosen and Soledad O'Brien, I mean, these are people I follow on Twitter, you know, Heidi Moore. There's a lot of people who basically called them out and said like, yep. stop doing this sort of, um, template-based journalism and nobody seems to listen? Is there some sort of idea that we know better than you or um, we've always done it this way so we'll continue to do it this way? I mean, they've been called out a lot, but they seem not to respond. I don't understand why they don't respond at all. Um, I, I put them in a few tribes. Uh, one is the political tribe, and that's about access journalism. It's about we know best. As Jay Rosen says, it's about the savvy. Uh, then there's the New York Times tribe as a unique tribe unto itself, and mind you, I respect the New York Times. They do a hell of a lot of good work. You mentioned McNeil earlier. They have very good reporters, but they also make mistakes. And they don't understand there, it seems to me, that uh, confessing your mistake is the best step toward credibility. Yeah. So if you criticize the New York Times on Twitter, there's a, there's a swarm of antibodies from the New York Times coming on to defend it rather than listening. Uh, there, you know, our profession as a whole, I, I started a, a program with a colleague named Carrie Brown at the school called Social Journalism, where we start by listening to, observing, understanding the community's needs before we start with the content. Yeah. That's revolutionary in my world. And that's why I, I, you know, I wanted to have this conversation, because if we're going to talk about community journalism, you start with the community. If we're going to talk about science journalism, you start with the science. And rather than coming to you with a story idea, to find the mechanisms when we can listen to you. And it strikes me that social media is a tremendous opportunity to say, oh my God, they're debating about this. I don't understand that. I'm an expert. Let me go and find out what's going on. Um, and I've been, uh, the best hope I have in this crisis is my Twitter feed because the best hope is science. And I get to see science in action there. Let me ask you one more question I'm, at, a, at a kind of personal level. As an epidemiologist, I've got to believe that this is, this moment is at one time uh, horrifying and fascinating. Um, how, because you deal with these numbers, you deal with this, you predict this going on, and it's got to be amazing data coming your way and amazing views of how this operates, but at the same time, you've got to be screaming, I told you so. How do you deal with this from your level of expertise kind of emotionally? 
Well, this isn't my first time at the rodeo. It's, it's right. you know, I, I, I sort of came of age in my youth in the HIV epidemic. And so like, um, you know, I was not a scientist then. I was sort of a college dropout sort of doing AIDS activism. And, but also sort of trying to struggle to information in, in, in the in time of tremendous loss. And I think it's the same thing here. I mean, I think, you know, for all the scientists I know working on this, um, you know, the, the, the scary thing to me is that this isn't the AIDS epidemic where um, this was a concentrated epidemic. And if you were in my community, the sort of staggering losses would be uh, um, sort of overwhelming to you. Now this is a generalized epidemic. And so the noose is gonna tighten around um, many, many, many more people. Um, and you know we're not at the peak of deaths yet in, in Connecticut or in the US. And so you know the sort of personal loss that many scientists are gonna face um, you know, many of us know clinicians who are, you know, uh, on the wards now. Um, we're going to see friends and colleagues sort of start to, to fall away over the next few weeks. Uh, if we can't get this under control, it's going to be, you know, our families and friends could be us. Um, so we're in the middle of it. And it's interesting to, to um, study epidemiology in the, in, in the time of, the, of sort of the great pandemic of 2020. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of us are sort of trying to struggle with the human aspects of it much more than the scientific ones. We're, it's going to be years. It's going to be decades. It's going to be, you know, young people are getting PhDs now uh, or coming into sort of science. We're going to have whole careers built on what, what is happening to us now. I think sort of people are sort of struggling like you are uh, and people in other fields with sort of the human toll of it right now um, and trying to sort of figure out how they can be useful. I mean, a lot of scientists are just sort of like, you know, don't work on coronavirus like I don't work on coronavirus and want to try to be useful. Some of us are having to sort of resist the urge to throw ourselves into into the, the sort of mix and let people who have more specialized expertise sort of take the lead. And that's what I've tried to do. But also not forget that, you know, this is today's epidemic. The reason we invest in public health uh, and in public health research is because um, infectious diseases will always be with us. Um, but pandemics are man-made creations and they're going to come up again and again as long as we, you know, we are on the planet. And so uh, this time there's a coronavirus. We don't know what it's going to be next time. Uh, and so trying to keep focus on our own work uh, that works on other microbes and other aspects of public health, infectious disease, um, is going to be important too because we don't know where the next uh, uh, zoonosis is going to come and sweep the world. We've had a dress rehearsal for, for the big one. This is pretty big, but it's it's still not gonna be the 1918 influenza, which you know could easily uh, be the next thing we face. Well, on that cheery note, uh, Doctor, I, uh, I wanna thank you very much, not only for talking to me and taking the time today to talk to, I hope, journalists through this, but also I think for your generosity of being public, of being on Twitter, of sharing your views, of being blunt and honest, and, uh, and human, and I'm grateful for that. So thank you very much, and I hope you um, stay healthy. You too. Thanks. All right.